How's this for a Saturday afternoon in Burnley Town Centre? This is April 2020. It's like a science fiction film. Even a war wouldn't create this eerie atmosphere. Look at the pigeons struggling to find lunch. Of course, this is how it's been all over the world over the last 18 months or so. Something this generation has never experienced before. Covid-19 knocked everyone for six. Governments across the world were given tasks they could never have imagined. The NHS, of course, were the heroes. It became almost normal to go outside every Thursday at eight o'clock to show our appreciation by joining in the clapping. Good evening everyone and a very warm welcome to our Newsreel 21. That was just a small reminder of how lucky we all are. I don't think the world as we know it has ever experienced anything quite like the last couple of years. Indeed, we thank you for your support tonight. We must also thank the many people who battled on keeping the world going, including the NHS and other key workers. Also those wonderful scientists who have produced the vaccines at incredible speed. We thank all those people for us being here tonight. So our show includes events from 2019, 2020 and 2021. You will see Burnley's efforts to stem the spread of Covid. COPD and things like that, a bit edgy when they go in, but they've all, everybody's gone through and they've all come out the other end and said, well it's not like I thought it would be, it's a lot easier than what I A tribute to Bob Clark, a wonderful hard-working Padium councillor. Also, we see a couple of events to help our very own Pendleside Hospice. But we start tonight with one of Burnley's most poignant annual events. This one was back in 2019. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. have always been my favourite drone shots. Of course, I'm not kidding anyone. These scenes are part of the Pendle Forest Model Railway Society's exhibition at Cone in November 2019. It's amazing how realistic these model railways are these days, and the Pendle Forest Model Railway Society pull all the stops out to give a wonderful display of their fantastic hobby. Bob Lord became chairman of Burnley Football Club in 1955. With his outspoken views on the game, he became one of the most controversial characters in football. And uh, possibly be with his family. More than Dave Thomas and Mike Smith are co-authors of the new biography on Bob Lord. Burnley filmmakers caught up with Mike at the opening of the exhibition on Lord at Townley Hall. Right, Mike, you are co-author of the book Bob Lord of Burnley and a partner in this exhibition that's been set up. What's your involvement with Burnley at the football club? Um, only really as a supporter, um, which I've been since um, early 60s, which my dad took me on and uh, he worked for Bob Lord in the old days. And um, I had the idea of doing a book on my own um, and found that Dave Thomas was doing the same idea. And I'd started from Bob Lord's early days and David started from the other end and it was such a big undertaking that we decided to uh, put both of our efforts together uh, because it, it, it was taking up so much time. So we came up with the idea of having uh, an exhibition of Lord. We had a, quite a number of artefacts, um, newspaper cuttings as you can see. He was always in the, in the press. Um, we have photographs which we got from the Burnley Civic Trust. Um, I'd taken some photographs, my dad had some photographs. 
Dave had quite a lot of memorabilia. Um, people like Kathy Pickup, whose father worked for Lord as the secretary, we got some photographs from Kathy. So altogether, we had a number of things that we thought, well, we've got a lot more than a book here, and it would be good if people could see everything that we managed to pull together. Having collected all the material, we uh, we approached uh, Townley and spoke to Mike Town uh, Mike Townend. Uh, who's the uh, curator here, and Mike was very keen for us to have uh, an exhibition. So, uh, just before the book was published, we were working uh, alongside the, uh, the people here, uh, Robert and Mike and various other staff at the Town Hall to produce all the, the panels that you can see around the walls. So, how long has the exhibition been running? The exhibition opened uh, in, uh, in the autumn, uh, it was scheduled to run uh, until the end of February, but um, it's been so popular, I believe. Mike Tynan said it's been quite a popular exhibition, and um, we, they've extended it until the end of May. Right, thank you very much, Mike. On Wednesday, the 19th of May, Burnley fans returned to Turf Moor to watch their beloved Clarets. In line with government's COVID guidelines, numbers were restricted, and the football club issued 3,500 tickets via an online ballot for the Clarets' final home game against Liverpool. Queues formed early and the turnstiles opened at 7 o'clock. After a short while queuing, tickets were scanned, passports and photo IDs checked, and entry was granted to the ground. Once inside the ground, strict guidelines on social distancing and face coverings were enforced by the ground staff. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to all the fans. It's uh, been a long time, I think. It's uh, been a tough year for everybody. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all the fans out there. Uh, for it was great to see the Clarets again. It had been 14 months since the last home game in front of spectators. The team were given a great reception when they lined up just before kickoff. Unfortunately, Burnley lost the game by three goals to nil. Still, I suppose it was good for the fans to get back. <laughs> Sunday, June the 27th this year, was the 100th year anniversary of Padium Memorial Park. <laughs> to help celebrate the occasion, Councillor Bob Clark had donated a memorial stone. Mr Bob Clark has donated the memorial stone which will be uh, unveiled in just a wee while. Many councillors and dignitaries were also in attendance. Thank you very much. So much for the town for his community work. Much to Bob's surprise, he was also presented with the freedom of the town. Um, today, to present him as freedom of the town. The shortest sentence I've ever to say. But what we must remember, friends, we are here because they were there, the veterans. The big elements to the veterans.
A close friend of Bob's, Barry Brown, endorsed the proceedings with some well-chosen words of thanks for all the work that Bob had done for Padium. But there's a saying that some people, they are salt of the earth. And Bob Clark fits this appellation absolutely. Because Bob is. Because Bob has done so much for this town, much of which none of us know about. He doesn't go about with a sort of a silent above and blank flame. Bob does it quietly. The happy day was finished off with the hurricane flying over the park. Unfortunately, one week after this wonderful occasion, Bob, known as Mr. Padium, sadly passed away. Granddaughter Sophie Clark said he passed away peacefully, knowing he had achieved everything he'd wished for and was delighted to receive the freedom of the town, which was well deserved. I think everything about the last two years has been said. The world has had one of the most frightening couple of years in its recent history. Burnley's fight against COVID-19 was a strong one and by May this year the country was beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The town had a number of vaccination centres and the folk of Burnley and Pendle were responding well. Gordon and Kathleen Birtwistle have always been in the front line when it comes to the needs of our town, Burnley, and the Covid pandemic was no exception. So if we had between the Friday and the following Tuesday to organise what we call Burnley Jabs Army. I asked Gordon if anyone was apprehensive about having the jab. It's not really, but we've had a few people have been, particularly people who have like... COPD and things like that, they're a bit edgy when they go in, but they've all, everybody's gone through and they've all come out the other end and said, well, it's not like I thought it would be, it's a lot easier than what I thought it would be. If you're not used to this, it's blue cyanide and there's a little strip in one edge. Yeah. Are you part of some people? Yeah. Do you know that Charles is applying on Saturday? Of course, there is a procedure to follow for patients when they arrive. Yeah. Basically, you go to the first, the first stick is meet and greet. So you go there and you'll be questioned about have you got a bad cough, bad cold, have you any symptoms of coronavirus? You'll be asked to change your mask if it's not one of these masks and we sanitise the hands and then go from there to the second day. Through, down to the next part, they'll get you booked through. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So they're all put on computer and then they wait in there and then they go down a passageway to be taken into one of five rooms where the injection's done. Do you want to take a seat, Bernard? Just here. Up for your, your second Pfizer vaccination yes. today, haven't you? The nurse then asks a number of questions and informs the patient of possible effects of the second vaccination. <laughs> now, so I like, that's it. I'm just about to give it now. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, it's going to take about two weeks for that to be fully effective. Uh -huh. At the moment, you should have about 60 to 70 percent protection with your first vaccine. Uh -huh. In about two weeks' time, your uptake of that vaccine should be in full effect, and you should have about 90 to 95 percent protection. Yeah. That's with the current strain that we've got in the UK at the moment. There so. are two lead clinicians. The lead clinicians are Dr. Yazara Nahid and Dr. James Fleming. In November, there was a national mandate, basically, for all the primary care networks to come together and open up the vaccination sites so that we could vaccinate our vulnerable communities. Basically, the, the top, top priority groups with more complex problems um, and then, you know, they might be complicated, so they wanted to make sure that they had the medical support and uh, we set up the site in St Peter's alongside my colleague, Dr Fleming, who is the clinical director for Burnley West. Just as a process of organisation, we, we put it together um, we set up fridges and we uh, got a rotor together and we've currently got about 200 plus staff from Burnley General Practice who've worked down here and we're doing it on a rolling rotor um, so 
at any one time every every practice in um, Burnley is missing a few staff because they're down here back Baseball. <laughs> <laughs> really good yeah we seem to have had a lot of uh, smiling faces a lot of happy kids and grown-ups as well so I think for our first event in nearly two years I think it's been a success it's um you know been slightly different to what we used to have to what we used to run with but um you know we've adapted and I think people have still they really enjoyed it and as you can see I've not escaped the colour myself so yeah and neither of you <laughs> We've had uh, help from so many volunteers, marshalling the routes, taking part in uh, organising the stalls, setting up the event and now we're just packing away the event but uh, we can't manage any of our things without people volunteering so if you feel like you'd like to give us a call in the fundraising office and come and volunteer for us. Run fast as you can! <laughs> Sean Foxcroft is a man with a mission. His goal is to raise one million pounds for Pendleside Hospice through his campaign, The Pendleside Warriors. Burnley filmmakers met up with Sean at the start of his campaign. I asked Sean what made him want to start the Pendleside Warriors. Well, a few years ago my uncle and my grandma both, in a close period of time, both got pancreatic cancer and we lost them uh, within a few short months. Uh, it impacted me massively, uh, but my uncle spent his last days here. Uh, he was in a lot of pain. Bearing that in mind, when COVID came along and the article went out saying that they're going to be short a million pound, yeah, and I just thought, what's the toughest thing that I could possibly do? And that's where the Pendleside Warriors came in, because I just thought, if I can find warriors to band together and all get out fundraising, um, then the million pound is not that unachievable. The chief executive of Pendleside Hospice is Helen McVeigh. I asked Helen how the coronavirus pandemic had affected the hospice's finances and how volunteers like Sean can help. Um, it's, it's really challenging. We were predicting a million pound deficit when we started the pandemic um, and that was our shops closing, our fundraising events stopping. Um, 
but then we then we did get some support from the government and things as well so so we've had a better year than we thought but equally what we think is that the pandemic's not over we've got another 12 months two years of this uh, uncertainty you know thinking can we run an event can't we run an event can we people sort of be restricted on how they can fundraise and things so um, I think it's very difficult to put a, a figure to it at the moment because we don't know the longer term effects of the, the pandemic um, and we think it will continue and have that impact as, as much longer and money so therefore any support that anybody can give us is really really needed. Pendleside's Head of Corporate Fundraising is Christina Cope and I asked her how the Pendleside Warriors will make a difference to the hospice. So many people helping Sean um, with the Pendleside Warriors will be amazing because collectively they hope to, he hopes to raise uh, a million pounds so that um, shared between a lot of people would really help the hospice and um, you know we need all the funds we can get to uh, carry on caring for local people. And we really encourage people to get behind um, Sean and do the Pendleside Warriors and become a Pendleside Warrior! This has been organised by Beyond the Experience. We spoke to the chef, but first we had a word with one of the setting up organisers. So yeah, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to help with uh, a pop-up restaurant, bar with entertainment uh, for all ages. Um, we've got a brilliant chef here as well. Uh, I'll let the chef tell you a little bit more about his background, but the food's phenomenal, the entertainment's great, the drink's fantastic. Um, yeah, it'd be great to see as many people down as possible from June till September. That's great. Uh, and it's just coming together this weekend, it's a trial weekend this weekend, we open fully next weekend. Uh, we've got some lovely things on the menu, uh, some lobsters, we're going to have scallops, um, almost like a share box really, some steaks in there, plenty of stuff, plenty of nice club as well. Are you going to check this? think of this place? Oh, it's ace. It's brilliant. You like it? Absolutely. Yeah. Loving it, yeah. When did you find out about it? Um, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook and then friends. And right. Unfortunately, because of some admin problems, the project didn't last as long as they'd hoped, and they had to close down. My word, Padium Town Centre has had a real facelift, and it looks great. These people are the Padium Community Choir. Padium Painting is an annual event that inspires local and not-so-local artists of all types 
to demonstrate their talent. this young lady about the event. Then we're doing a big painting event for Plan Air artists and they're going to be outside around Padium, potted around the area and people get to go and see artists actually creating work. Um, then we have a vintage bus that takes you down to Gawthorpe Hall um, that will bring you around... Did she say vintage bus? I'll have some of that. arrival at Gawthorpe Hall, we find many more artists at work. I asked these young ladies when they arrived. Been here since uh, yeah. 8 o'clock this morning. We arrived from Cheshire. Cheshire, yes. Very good. Yeah, we're housewives from Cheshire. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> You've done it at school, though, haven't you? Oh, at school? Yeah. And then there was, there was like, a 50-year gap. Nice. <laughs> 50. <laughs> and here I am. Fortunately, the weather was good, and the event was a great success. It's just such a brilliant surface to paint on. It looks a bit rough at the moment, but that's how it will be at this stage. Oh, my background. Well, I'm, I'm an art teacher, a tutor, I do private teaching. Um, I have worked in colleges as well. And you always have a struggle to draw the hall. So I've drawn that out on some squared paper, and that's going to go on this. Burnley has achieved another contribution to the restoration of an important historical item, keeping our history visible for the future. Historian, teacher and counsellor Roger Frost MBE is on the front line when it comes to Burnley's history and on Sunday the 19th of September this year Mr Frost led a walk from the Weaver's Triangle along the canal towpath to Oakmount Mill to view the modified steam engine which dates from 1887 and has been restored with financial help from the Heritage Lottery Fund and the Science Museum Prism Fund. Uh, I'm leading a walk to the engine house from here down the canal, which is only about half a mile, and we'll be pointing out various features on the canal and start talking about the, this area in particular. Has the, this new engine room, has it been just been re, re, revitalised in some way? Uh, we own it. It's part of uh, a mill on Wiseman Street, but we own the engine house, and it's not driven by steam anymore. Uh -huh. It's driven by electricity, which is better for us, because you just imagine having to keep a, a boiler going, oh, yeah. because it's not completely authentic, but at least we've got the engine. Yeah, and you can kind of switch it on or off. Oh, yeah, they, yeah, there'll be a gentleman there who'll demonstrate it, and I'll talk about it when I've done my part. The group then set off with Roger stopping to answer questions or to explain the historical significance to various parts of the canal. <laughs> the first thing is if you just look back up where we've been, you can see a much better view of the uh, Thank you. 
And it was called, uh, as it was originally called Sandy Gate Mill, but it was uh, uh, Coxton, it had 64,000 in Indians. I was an apprentice of the company that made the engine, so I have a certain affinity to it. You know, I, I was one of the last apprentices at Foster Yates and Tom in Blackburn. And the first place I worked there was the boiler shop where they were still making Lancashire boilers, like the type that would have operated this, this engine. In late April, the Higham Parish Council started work on their entry for the 2021 Bescot Village Competition. Our reporter, Carl Stredder, caught up with the organising team. Now then, ladies, can you tell me how you actually got involved with this project? The Chair of the Parish Council approached me about nine months ago to say that if the competition runs again this year, would I be prepared to take on um, coordinating the preparations for our entry? Which I said, yes, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, and then I think he invited both Jackie and Lucy as well. Yeah. So it'd be nice because it's only been the only time when there's been three ladies on the, on the, on the council. parish council. So we would like to do it between us. So we said, yes, that's that's a project. Project. Yeah. 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 Their first task was to walk around the village to assess what needed to be done. Yes, yeah, so absolutely delighted with the turnout um, this morning. Um, more villagers actually than I thought and I know there's still a few more people um, yet to turn up who are going to be doing some wood staining of benches but everybody's come out to really for a mammoth effort in terms of weeding that needs to be done before Tuesday so absolutely delighted. news that we've actually got round to well we've actually got through to the second round of the judging of the Lancashire Best Kept Village competition so delighted but obviously relieved as well because we know that um, there's a lot of tough competition out there 46 villages um, are taking part we know that we're one of 12 in the champion class but we don't know how many have got through to the second round so still a little bit nervous but at least we're relieved that we've got through to the second round and now planning starts in terms of how we're going to get ourselves through to the final. I think the last time we spoke um, we mentioned that we'd actually got through to the second round um, but then we discovered that we didn't do as well as we'd hoped so we didn't actually get through to the final round. There were odd things like maybe the odd bench that maybe needed a bit more paint on it or um, I think they mentioned something about the door to the church, again, needed some varnishing. So just a few minor points really that meant that we couldn't actually get through as a whole village. Um, we were pleased to find out once the judging had taken place that some of our outstanding features had performed really well. In particular, the village hall, um, which was runner up in the public building category. We also got highly commended status for the village uh, having come third in the competition but also um, we were commended for our war memorial outside the church um, as well as our threepenny bit which is the public garden so um, there were quite a few outstanding features that we did really well in so we're actually delighted about that. Well thank you Diane it's been very interesting and I really do hope that next year brings us a little bit better luck for you. The first Saturday in each month sees Burnley's Artisan Market. We visited on the 6th of November and we see Burnley Centre full of market stalls offering many things from homemade food to art and craft items. 
This exciting venture has been organised by Lisa Cowley. She developed the Independent Street Brand, which organised a series of monthly and one-off events alongside councils and business groups, etc. We spoke to Lisa during this very busy Saturday morning. Yeah, so this is the Burnley Artisan Market, which is running, uh, we launched this year, and it's running in conjunction with Burnley Council and also Burnley Bid. And it's a new initiative for the town um, to bring footfall back to the high street. Um, and we've got 60 stalls here today selling the very finest local food, drink, art and craft, all small businesses and local independent um, companies. Uh, so it's monthly, so we're here on the first Saturday of every month. So we're obviously gearing up now for Christmas and um, Christmas next next month for our special Christmas event um, and then we'll be relaunching from February next year and running throughout 2022 which is fantastic news. Sutton um, and I'm singing today really excited and usually I have my horse trailer with me which is a converted um, I converted it into a, a mobile stage called oh, the voice box I see. but we've had some technical difficulties this morning so it's just me sure do well. <laughs> but um, it's gonna be a lovely day yeah looking forward to it this is my lovely technical um, PA niece Natasha who I don't know how I would do anything without her she's amazing <laughs> Uh, love the place, uh, great market, great people. Um, my stuff is a uh, unique wood, uh, driftwood, bogwood, uh, root ball. Uh, get it from all over, beaches, swamps, uh, and foraging all the time. Uh, and then recreate, give it a new lease of life if I can. Down and all we see the girl that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They pay paradise, put up a parking lot. I do like farmers market mostly and then the different events. Um, I'm linked with different uh, companies. So yeah. So far so good. Late last night, I heard the screen door slam. And a big yellow taxi took away my I um, put the quartz on and paint them and varnish them and yeah, that's it. everything's handmade, yeah. The, the wooden blocks are handmade, the cards are handmade. Uh -huh. Stefan makes the sea glass jewellery and the bracelets. So. I was also lucky enough to bump into our mayor on his poppy appeal. But it's lovely to see you out there. Well, I'm delighted to be here this morning right, with the British Legion and yes, uh, collecting for uh, the poppy appeal. That's There's lovely, no greater it? cause. No, there isn't so, indeed. And we're hoping that Burnley people will show the usual generosity this morning, and I'm but sure they will. I so. understand. So, I believe you're here, sir, in December uh, to open uh, the, the Christmas party this month. I, I, I am, and we're definitely looking to forward to that. Myself and the mayoress, I know that this is, I think, the third one, and they've been really successful so far and I'm sure they'll be going from strength to strength and people are really looking forward to the Christmas market in December and we'll be delighted to be here to support it. It's been a very long run up to a Christmas that we're normally used to but Burnley was ready for the challenge as each Saturday up to this exciting time of year there was something for everyone going on in the town centre. A young man with a wonderful voice entertaining the shoppers. More, much more this I didn't Brilliant filmmaker Kevin Ferber, director of Creative Management, was also in town, deeply involved in one of his projects.
Yes, the kids were having a whale of a time. We had a word with one of the organisers. What we're doing today is we are entertaining around the shopping and trying to get shoppers to come into Burnley Town Centre and enjoy the Christmas atmosphere. What's the weather like up there, dear? It's uh, very dry at the minute. Is it? Do you, yes. What about the forecast? Do you think this afternoon is going to be any better? Yes, I'm hoping for snow today. Considering it's getting close to Christmas, the turkeys were very chatty. Even the children approved. Let us hope that our world rolls on to a safer future. Once again, we can only thank you all for your support tonight without which it would be very difficult for us to keep going. So please have a safe journey home and remember, life always offers you a second chance. It's called tomorrow.